In this video, I want to ask the audience a question. It's a serious question. And I'll go through the evidence of why I'm asking it in a minute. The question is this. Does the handling of this virus amount to torture? On the face of it, it might seem like a ridiculous question, and I can already hear the objections to it. But I'm going to take you through evidence from an Amnesty International report from 1975 where they took a deep look at torture, what constitutes it, what it does to people, and what methods actual torturers have used in this thing called no-touch torture. It's psychological torture. It's mental torture. And by the end of this, I hope that you will see that the question doesn't have an easy answer. In fact, I think you will come to the conclusion that yes, indeed, the responses to this coronavirus in many regions of the world do in fact amount to torture. I'm going to also talk about why they would want to do this very briefly at the end. And after I'm finished presenting this material, I'm also going to include um, responses from the general public to a question that I put out to them, which was, what do you feel you have been forced to do during this pandemic that you would otherwise not do? All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's begin by looking at excerpts from this 1975 Amnesty International Report on Torture. I want to take you to page 34, where they are going through the four elements of torture. They say that at least two persons must be involved, the torturer and a victim or victims, and that the victim is under the physical control of the torturer. They move to the second element, which is the basic one of the infliction of acute pain and suffering. They specify in this paragraph that Definitions that would limit torture to physical assaults on the body exclude mental and psychological torture, which undeniably causes acute pain and suffering. So they say those two elements must be incorporated in any definition. The third element of torture identified in the Amnesty International Report on Torture says that the intention of the torturer must be to make the victim submit, to break his will, and destroy his humanity. And finally, they say, torture implies a systematic activity with a rational purpose. It says, the unwitting and thus accidental infliction of pain is not torture. Torture is the deliberate infliction of pain, and it cannot occur without the specific intent of the torturer. Inherent in this element of purpose are the goals or motives for employing torture, and while torture can be used for a variety of purposes, it is most generally used to obtain confessions or information for punishment and for the intimidation of the victim and third persons. The first two motives relate directly to the victim, while the purpose of intimidation, in wide use today as a political weapon, is intended to be a deterrent to others as well as the victim. So in those four elements, we see where Amnesty International defines the boundaries. And they finally come up with a concrete definition that they use for the remainder of their report, their report and it is this. The definition of torture adopted here is, torture is the systematic and deliberate infliction of acute pain in any form by one person on another or on a third person in order to accomplish the purpose of the former against the will of the latter. TLDR, they want to force people to do something. Amnesty International describes a little bit about how this mechanism works when they talk about torture as a stress. In physical torture, of course, one of the big things that they do is they bind people into very uncomfortable uh, body positions. And we've seen this over and over. And that is body stress, that's physical stress. But torture can be a mental stress too. In this section, Amnesty International describes torture as stress and they go through acute, short-lived, shock response type stress subacute medium-term stress, which produces anxiety response, but allows the victim to maintain morale and personal integrity, and then through to the chronic response to stress, which is long-standing, and it includes depression, suicidal ideation, dissociation, derealization, regression, becoming accident-prone, 
a loss of will to live, and possibly suicide. This is the stage the torturers want people to get to. They want to move everybody through the shock. Let's say you, when you first get taken prisoner. Now this is all about POWs, remember. But we can apply this more widely, and that's what I'm going to do shortly. So their, ex their experiences of acute stress might be the initial capture. And then the subacute stress is when they're first, they don't know what's going on and they're first being interrogated and uh, maybe left hungry, maybe left sleeping on in terrible conditions and this sort of thing. But in that condition, the soldier still believes in the mission. He still believes that he can get out of there. He still believes he can cope with the torture that they're putting him through. And then if it goes on long enough, they move to this chronic stress phase, which as you see, results in a more devastating results. And this can all be done without ever touching the prisoner. An interesting side note here before we move on to more specifics in this general area of torture. They say that in chronic stress, people give up. They give up their will to live. They lose their, their respons normal responses and desires. But they also say giving up could take other forms. In their study of soldiers who were POWs for a longer period of time, they say men became susceptible to illnesses like bronchopneumonia, asthma, bronchitis, coronary disease, TB, and cancer. Look how many of those, though, are bronchial. And what would a bronchial stress response look like today in the paradigm they've created? They would make you a suspect of having COVID wouldn't they? Would they say bronchial pneumonia, asthma, and bronchitis? So you're super stressed. You develop bronchial sy sy symptoms and you go to the doctor and they're going to lump you in with the COVID people, thereby increasing your stress and putting you into their system more deeply. Nobody wants to be involved in this contact tracing thing or be forced to be intubated or be separated from their loved ones. Nobody wants that. So it's, it's an evil genius of this type of torture that I say we're under right now, that our stress responses themselves are used against us. Amnesty International goes on to describe how people are manipulated and how they resist. And they say it is the transition from the subacute to the chronic stress response that the torturer seeks to orchestrate initially by systematically weakening the subject. This forms part of the classic pattern of manipulation described by the post Korean war research of a guy called Biderman. Biderman was instrumental in debunking the myth that Chinese had used mysterious or magical means to brainwash the allied prisoners of war. He found out that they just used this psychological manipulation technique, which is now called DDD, Dependency, Debility, and Dread. The coercive technique for psychological torture, induced dependency, debility, and dread. So let's look at that. Now keep in mind, they're looking at this from an interrogator point of view. So they say questioners here, but you can replace it with coercers or torturers. First part, debility, physical weakness. For centuries, questioners have employed various methods of inducing physical weakness, prolonged constraint, prolonged exertion, extremes of heat, cold or moisture, and deprivation of sleep. The assumption is that lowering the subject's physiological resistance will lower his psychological capacity for resistance. They say here, however, there's been no scientific investigation of this assumption. That is absolutely not true. They go on. Many psychologists consider the threat of inducing debility to be more effective than debility itself. Prolonged constraint or exertion, sustained deprivation of food or sleep often become patterns to which the subject adjusts and then he becomes apathetic, withdrawing into himself in search of escape from the discomfort or tension. In this case, debility would be counterproductive. And what they mean there, of course, is that if you're trying to get your victim to take some action or answer some question, rendering him incapacitated is counterproductive to your particular mission. So it really depends on what your mission is, whether or not debility would work for you. 
Another coercive technique is to manipulate the subject's environment to disrupt patterns, not to create them, such as arranging meals and sleep should be granted irregularly, in more than abundance or in less than adequacy, or no discernible time pattern. This is done to disorient the subject and destroy his capacity to resist. As you're listening, I hope you're reflecting this on our current situation. Nobody can deny that that is what's happened with lockdown, with uh, mask wearing, with social distancing. Once stability is achieved, they can induce a, a dependency back onto the torturer. The victim is helplessly dependent upon the torturer for the satisfaction of all basic needs. Seems obvious how that applies to our current situation. And finally, once the chronic stress phase is reached, the victim goes into a sense of dread, intense fear and anxiety. Sustained long enough, a strong fear of anything vague or unknown induces regression. A word of caution, they say. If the debility, dependency, dread state is unduly prolonged, the subject may sink into a defensive apathy from which it is hard to arouse him. If you are a torturer in search of answers and information from your subject, you don't want him to regress totally into basically, a, you know, go into the fetal position and just give up on life because you need things from him. I argue that in our current situation with the coronavirus torture, what they want from their victims, all of us, is basically for us to regress to a childlike state because the only thing they want from us is for us to blindly obey them. They don't need answers from us. They need exactly nothing from us. They just want to control us completely. Okay. Earlier we mentioned Biderman. He was the one that said, look, the Chinese, they're not magic. They're just using basic psychological manipulation. That's how they're getting these soldiers to make these crazy confessions and give them all this wrong information or right information. They just applied psychological torture to them. It's no touch torture is another way of putting this. Also, another word for torture in this context is coercion. So we look at Biderman's chart of coercion and they list the general methods in this column. Isolation, monopolization of perception, induced debility and exhaustion, threats, occasional indulgences, demonstrating omnipotence, degradation, and enforcing trivial demands. Did you recognize any of those in what we're going through right now? Let's look at some things that came to my mind when I first read this list. Isolation, are they doing that to us? It's obvious that they are. They've got us in self-isolation. They even use that word. And as far as the variants, are we in complete solitary confinement? Well, sometimes some people are. They are in the hospital without being able to contact or see their loved ones at all. Think of nursing homes. Uh, that, that's also group isolation. But individual patients are basically in complete solitary confinement. The other examples of this that we are going through right now are the travel quarantines, the social circles that in my province, they're trying to get you to write out 10 people that they will allow you to see without any restrictions. And I've already mentioned that nursing homes fit into the group isolation category. Let's move on to monopolization of perception. What comes to my mind with monopolization of perception is the 24-7 news cycle and the censorship of any opposing voices. I think of their repeated phrases that they are all using and that they're putting on signage and social media, the troll armies, the sock puppet armies, and even the uh, paid sort of shills like, what's that one with David Brock, Media Matters, that go out and they just amplify the message of the torturers. They talk about Monopolization of perception being physical isolation as well. So we're, that brings back the self-isolation issue. They guilt trip us with, you've brought this on yourselves. You're killing people with your selfishness. And they mention barren environments, restricted movement, monotonous food. Well, the shutdowns of the businesses make a barren environment. They 
don't let us cross borders in some cases. We're not allowed in stores. They've closed restaurants and that's monotonous food. We've had food shortages, that's monotonous food. They've closed gyms, hospitals, and clinics. And that would be number three, induced de debility and exhaustion. If you can't look after yourself, you're going to be debilitated and weakened mentally and physically. They mention semi-starvation, exposure, exploitation of wounds, and for those I can think of the food shortages, the closures of restaurants, the not getting together with your family. Some people are dependent on family dinners or meals on wheels. So semi-starvation, it may not be as dramatic for most of us as it is for some of us, but I think it still could be considered a feature of this lockdown exposure, which for a prisoner of war would be something like being left freezing cold. For us, it's the outdoor lineups out in the elements. I was lined up in the snow. I was lined up in the rain. I have been lined up in the beating sun with no relief. Why aren't they putting shelters anywhere? I mean, maybe it's just where I am, but there's not a single business that asks you to line up outside, which has provided even a tent cover. You know, those those things people use at art fairs and that? They're not even, even providing that for people. So if this was really about care and concern and we're all in this together and we want to make everybody healthy and comfortable and happy, why after these long months have they not put shelters up? That's one of the things for me that gives the whole game away. And there's so many more. Exploitation of wounds, I think, is the contact tracing. They tell you you've tested positive. Even if you're showing no symptoms, they can tell you you've tested positive. And then they exploit that. They exploit your diagnosis to put you in this contact tracing Stasi tracking system. Sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation comes from the stress we're all feeling. Many people have told me that they have not been able to sleep a full night or they wake up startled. You know, when you have bad anxiety and you wake up suddenly. Prolonged constraint, prolonged interrogation. What do they mean by prolonged? This was supposed to be 15 days to stop the spread, if you recall. Then it was 30 days to stop the spread. And how long is it now? They've given up even using that catchphrase because obviously it would be embarrassing for them at this point. Threats is the next category. It cultivates anxiety and despair. Well, there's threats all over the place from this thing. Let me start here. These are a collection, this is a collection of headlines. Some of these are from March. More will die unless people stay home, says Mayor Sadiq Khan. 250,000 will die unless stricter virus measures are adopted, warns scientists. Fauci warns COVID-19 cases could surge if stay-home orders lifted too quickly. Fulford Head warns people, more people will die unless social distancing happens. Restarting America means people will die, so when do we do it? Who warns of more deaths if lockdown is lifted? And there's been so many more since then. Those were from March. Think how often they've reiterated, a second wave might come. If you don't do this, more people will die. You are putting immunocompromised people at risk with your selfishness and you're going to cause massive suffering if you don't do what we say. So yes, threats are a main feature of this torture and coercion from the COVID response. There's other threats too that your children will be removed if you test positive and haven't made other arrangements. They threaten us that we're all going to have to take this vaccine, the likes of which has never been seen before, these RNA vaccines, and that the vaccines might have tracking chips or ID chips in them. These are threats. Saying that this is the new normal is a threat that they're never going to give us back full access to our liberties that we had only five months ago. The threat of going to the hospital, the threat of getting sick and being pulled into this diabolical system as a patient. Now you're a COVID patient. Now what's going to happen? There's all kinds of examples here. There's threats of death. Yes, we have that. Threats of non-return. Yes, that's the new normal. Threats of endless interrogations and isolation. Yes, threatening that we're going to get into this contact tracing circle. Threats against family? Yes, CPS removed the children. Vague threats? 
Yes, there's too many vague threats to even count. And that's just the first page. We've got more we could go through here in this Biderman's chart of coercion. Occasional indul indulgences. What have they given to us? Well, remember, corporations were offering free delivery for sm and, and small sales and different perks for people if to be good corporate citizens. You remember that? That's an indulgence for us. That goes with the occasional favors. Fluctuations of interrogators' attitudes? Yes, that comes into play when we look at how they treated the BLM protests and the Pride protests, where they've actually said that BLM protests didn't spread COVID. That's what they've told us. And yet, flip that around, whether you like him or not, they've said Trump rallies are dangerous and shouldn't be held because of the risk of spreading COVID. And we can see this with all kinds of things. Why are we allowed in Walmart and the liquor store, but we're not allowed in mom and pop shops? So these are the indulgences, but they're giving them to themselves and their corporate partners, mostly. They give rewards for partial compliance. We can get things back if we just agree to wear masks. We can get things back if we just agree to always and forever continue social distancing. And they're going to come along with their, you can get to travel if you take the vaccine. This is on the chart of coercion, and coercion is another word for torture. Number six, demonstrating omnipotence. Well, obviously they've done that. They shut down the entire world economy. And they had corporations eating out of their hands. Or was it the corporations that did this in the first place? There's certainly an argument to be made about that. Omnipotence is when you can be a war criminal, practically, not even a doctor. And everyone refers to you as Dr. Tedros of the World Health Organization, and we should all listen to you. That's omnipotence. If you can go to that level where nobody questions you in spite of your record, and you can lay down rules for the world, that's pretty omnipotent. And there's so many more here that I've written down. Degradation, number seven makes cost of resistance appear more damaging to self-esteem than capitulation. Yes, I don't want to wear a mask, but guess what? We'll punish you more. You, even if you don't get sick, we'll punish you for not wearing a mask. It says reduces prisoner to animal level concerns. And it's true. How many people stocked up on toilet paper and food and firewood and things like that? We were concerned mainly with survival. And it is so sad that in the Western world, this handful of public health activists and some corporations and some NGOs, they've reduced us to that. We live in abundance, but they've reduced us to that. I mean, I can think of tons of Examples, closure of salons and, o and only allowing us to buy essential items, that degrades us. The mobbing, the deplatforming, the name calling, that's degrading. Masking is degrading. Social distancing is degrading. Young people directing old people on how to line up or where to stand in stores, that's degrading. Separation of ourselves from our loved ones, that's degrading. Holding our elders hostage in nursing homes, that's extremely degrading. And number eight, finally, enforcing trivial demands. This develops in the victim a habit of compliance. Well, almost everything that I've said already today is the enforcement of trivial demands. Stand six feet apart, follow the arrows, go in and out of certain doors, show support, get out there and clap and cheer and call grocery store clerks hero first responders, or else you will face social consequences. There's all kinds of things. I think it's clear that the steps they are taking in the name of COVID-19 amount to coercion, which amounts to torture. Torture is the systematic and deliberate infliction of acute pain in any form, so mental or psychological, too, by one person on another or on a third person in order to accomplish the purpose of the former against the will of the latter. And we looked at these four elements of torture right at the beginning. Well, let's sum up. 
first element of torture involves at least two persons torturer and victim. Yes, the torturers are the public health officials using lackeys in government media police and even radicalized fellow victims. And the victims are all the citizens of most countries. Second, the victim is under physical control of the torturer. Well, we're not talking about prisoner of war camps, so we are not locked up in a cell. But we are controlled physically by our torturers when you think about self-isolation, social distancing in public places, quarantines of both sick and healthy, which is arbitrarily enforced, the lockdown of businesses, parks, events, job losses, so financial capture as well, and or some people are forced to continue working in adverse circumstances. Separation of family members in formal and informal settings. Mandatory attire and behavior, masks and hand sanitizer and other things. Forced lineups to get food, banking or other supplies. And that's forced because lineups are not due to overcrowding. They're due to new rules. Income dependency on government and their emergency handouts travel restrictions, and limitations on purchases. These, I say, amount to physical control of victim by torturer. Let's look at the second element of torture. The infliction of acute pain and suffering, including mental and psychological pain and suffering. Well, we'll refer back to Biderman's chart of coercion for all those many examples of acute pain and suffering. Of note here, the Geneva Convention says that no physical or mental torture nor any form of coercion may be inflicted on prisoners of war. I can hear them now. Well, you're not prisoners of war. So technically, it doesn't count. But the spirit is there. And we are being coerced. So what they're doing to us is in violation of the spirit of the Geneva Convention. The next element of torture number three there is implicit in the no notion of the torture that the torturer wants the victim to submit the torturer wants to break the victim in order to destroy his humanity it is established that coercive techniques are being used by public health and their lackeys in media government etc it is established that public health wants the public to submit to many social economic and behavioral changes Many in the public object to these changes, but their concerns are being ignored at best and punished at worst. The political response to citizen objections has been to step up the coercive techniques against the electorate rather than to hold hearings or compromise with the electors. We can conclude, therefore, that the torturer wants the victim to submit, in this case, of COVID-19. They are not listening to what the electorate wants. They are trying to force us to submit. And therefore, I believe that ma matches with one of the criteria of the elements of torture. Since they are moving us along and prolonging the stress, they are bringing us all into the chronic stage where the victims of the coercion become broken and their compliance will be all but guaranteed, which brings us to the fourth element of torture. The torture is a systematic activity with a rational purpose. And this is where I have to help people to see. Some of you probably already see it. I get it. I preach to the choir a lot. But for new people coming along saying, this is, well, it's just an unfortunate side effect of how they have to handle the pandemic. I want to propose to you that they have a different purpose in mind. This isn't really about a pandemic at all. It's about the part where they break our will. So let's first define systematic to see if there's a systematic effort underway here. Systematic definition, acting according to a fixed plan or system, methodical. Is this methodical, this COVID-19 response? Well, remember, there was immediate agreement on the status and reaction to the pandemic across national boundaries, local boundaries, and political parties, and by world bodies, NGOs, and corporations. We had, and still have in some cases, frequent daily, regular, scheduled press appearances by officials and spokespeople about this matter. A domination of information is about this COVID-19 reaction. We had rapid production and distribution of signage, pamphlets, guidance materials, stickers for the floors. We had rapid universal adoption of new protocols across almost every major corporation. 
Media is speaking with one voice worldwide, so we have narrative homogeneity. Censorship is happening. Contradictory information either has warning labels on it or you can't see it at all. There's public shaming rituals against dissenters. There was the rollout of government handouts to affected persons and businesses, ready to go. Invasion into our smartphone settings for the purposes of tracking. Note, ditch your smartphone. I said we, but I don't have a smartphone. I haven't for a long time and I'm always online, so figure it out. If I can do it, you can do it. And finally, if we look, with the exception of very small details in the handling of COVID-19, the same responses have been enacted almost globally. So now, let's look at rational. Is there a rational element to this torture? Definition of rational, based on or in accordance with reason or logic. What is rational to globalists is not immediately seen as rational to everyday citizens. And let's face it, it's the globalists that are guiding this response. Oligarchs, corporate CEOs, NGO leaders, some elected politicians and global bodies are talking about COVID being an opportunity for the quote, great reset. Some call it the Fourth Industrial Revolution, some call it the Green New Deal, some call it the New World Order. They are all the same thing. And more and more lately, they are coming straight out and saying it. The mayor of Chicago absolutely stated clearly that they want to hire people who are in line with the, go the goals of the New World Order. And you make a mandate, um, and then you do training, particularly in the city, I'll call them licensing departments, whether it's zoning, buildings, um, housing will be impacted by it, planning certainly, um, and, it's, and, you, and you pick the people that run those agencies and the deputies that are pledging allegiance to the new world order and good governance. A highly placed elite in Canada, her name is Jody Butts. She was just made editor of a literary magazine. And in her tweet about it, she said that she was happy to put Canada in a good standing in the new world order. So when we look at whether or not there's a systematic, rational reason for the enacting of this torture, that's the reason. They need to break us. They want to break our spirit and our resistance to the Great Reset or the Green New Deal or the Fourth Industrial Revolution or the New World Order, whatever words you like. And the reason they need to break us before they bring it in, bring it in fully, is because the elements of this plan, the New World Order plan, the Fourth Industrial Revolution plan, are so extreme and radical that they know they would be fought on every front in many areas all over the world, this would be a very long implementation process for them. So if they can weaken us in advance through this COVID thing, break up family relationships, destroy the bonds between people, get children out of school, overwork parents, throw hundreds of thousands, millions and millions of people out of work and continue dangling this threat that the pandemic might come back any day, over our heads. We will be demoralized by all of this if they let it go on long enough. And through that demoralization, they can eliminate hard currency. They can put all schooling online. They can change to telehealth. They can let NGOs uh, and tech companies take over policing. And you see all of it. You see all of that happening right now among other things. So is the torture a systematic activity with a rational purpose? To them it is. I want to close with this because it addresses another objection I'm sure some will be thinking upon reading this, and that is that we have to do this. It's for the greater good. Well, Amnesty International had this to say when talking about torture. Those who consciously justify torture and are not candid enough to state that they use it to defend their own power and privilege rely essentially on the philosophic argument of a lesser evil for a greater good. They reinforce this with an appeal to the doctrine of necessity. The existential situation, COVID, forces them to make a choice between two evils. Allow freedom and liberty and have the virus spread? or lock everyone down, take everyone's freedom and choices and financial well-being and relationships away, 
and maybe fewer people will get sick. That's what they're presenting to us, and some people are buying it. Look at this comment I saw on Twitter. These selfish jerks who refuse to wear masks and actively thwart the greater good have always existed. Trump just emboldened them, and the pandemic exposed our darkest flaw. Individualism, me, 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 over collectivism, invest in the benefit of all citizens. They have put this collectivist mentality into so many people that, in effect, the torturers are now being joined by many of their victims who are helping them torture their other fellow citizens. I could go on and on and on about this topic, and I've missed a great deal of what I had planned to say because it's just getting too long. But please add your comments down below of the things this brings to mind and answer the original question that I posed. Does the handling of this virus amount to torture? I'm going to stop talking now. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. I will roll at the end of this video. I'm going to tag on just a scrolling screenshot of the people who answered my question already on Twitter. On Twitter, I said, what do you feel like you've been forced to do because of this pandemic response? And I got a lot of varied answers, so I'll show you those at the very, very end. But before I go, I want to say thank you to everybody who has um, sent in donations. The ones that were addressed wrongly, the ones that you addressed to Polly St. George, I have sent back to you in the mail. If you're sending a check, you have to address it to Poly Media. I do thank you so much, though, for the thought and the expense and the trouble you went to. I thank everybody who made successful contributions, whether they were gifts or beautiful letters or prayers. I, I am so grateful to all of you for that. That really gets me through. It gets me through this attempted demoralization that they're doing to us right now, the torture they're doing to us right now. And I want all of you to be heartened as well, because while all of this seems to be bad, bad, bad news, negative stuff, I truly believe that once you can name what's happening to you, you can begin to recover your morale and your ability to fight it and your spirit. Because it's happening to all of us. All of us are in this right now together. <laughs> I'll steal their phrase and I'll use it for good. We are all being tortured right now. But once you see it, it can be a bit of a game. It really can. And then you can also help save others from this depression and anxiety cycle they're probably going through right now too. So let's turn this around on them. Okay. If you'd like to contribute to my work, you can also send me something through paypal.me. I will leave the address in the description box. My PO box address is on my website, amazingpoly.net, on the contact page. I will leave links to references in the description box below. And um, that's it. I'm going to really stop talking. Until next time, everybody. Peace out.